All right, let's bring it back together. That was long enough. I've got plenty of pages today. So I'm really grateful we have wonderful elders at this church because one of our elders just came up to me and said, hey, Philip, you said Acts chapter 10. While I really like Peter and Cornelius in Acts chapter 10, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So sorry about that. The day ends in Y, and I will say at least two crazy things before the day's over, I promise. So I'm curious, for those of you who said yes or procured something, just remember mixed company, right? Like there are stories that we can't share here that may have happened to you, but it's not the place. So I'm just curious, anyone have a couple things that were not as advertised when they purchased and they were either super excited or really disappointed? Buying a car, anyone bought a lemon? Yep, there you go. (laughs) Absolutely, what else? New phone, not bad, not as good as advertised, all right. What else? (laughs) You ordered a camping chair and a bag, and all they sent was the bag. (laughs) You're small. You might, like, slide in there. (laughs) It's not. Didn't work? That's disappointing. All right. What else? It was the invisible chair. You just needed to pull harder. What what other things? What other things that were not as advertised? BB guns. BB guns. They're not as fun as you thought? No. Did you shoot your eye out? Oh, you got a bad batch. (laughs) There you go, man. All right. Well, what else? A a couple other things, and then we'll move on. This one actually applies later on. Don't worry. Sometimes they're just random, but this one's on purpose. What else? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you bought a pouch that promised if you put the potato in the microwave that it would cook nicely. And on a scale from one to unsuccessful, it was deeply unsuccessful. So there are things in life that promise to give great things to us and don't deliver on those promises. And I will make no football jokes today. I'm trying super hard. (laughs) But I am from California, and I definitely went to sleep before the game finished. But... When I got a myriad of texts at like 11.30 at night, I know what that my Niners won. Anyway, who cares? Anyway, all that to say, here's what we're doing. So I'm going to quickly summarize where we've been. Chapters 8, 9, and 10, Paul's addressing a question. So I wrote it down so I won't talk for so long on this part. Let's go. All right. So chapter 10 continues with the discussion that began in chapter 8 of 1 Corinthians. And Paul fleshed out even more last week in chapter 9. And here's the big question they're wrestling with. What should the Corinthians Christians think and do in regard to meat that was sacrificed to idols? And in in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Paul gives them two things to consider. First, he says, for the group of people said, hey, eat, eat the meat. He says, first, an idol really is nothing, like they said in chapter 8. And it was fine for Corinthian Christians who understand that meat is just meat to act according to this knowledge and eat the meat, right? Because how many of you love a good deal? Best deal in the city for meat was at the local temples. At second, Paul says in chapter 8, that Christian love is sometimes more important than being right. Has anyone here ever been right and lost a relationship before? It's very possible. You can be right and not loving and still be wrong all at the same time. And that's what Paul's saying here. He says, so even though you might know and be right that eating meat sacrificed to an idol is all right for you, if it causes someone around you to stumble, Paul says he wouldn't do it because it isn't the loving and God-honoring thing to do. And then Paul continues in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and he shared and talked about why it's so important for followers of Jesus to be willing to give up their rights. Let me clarify this. I did 55 minutes on it last week, so you're getting like the 40 second of the the hour long version of this. But Paul doesn't say, he says those things that you feel entitled to do. He says, sometimes in life, you have to give up your rights for the good of those around you. If you have a friend who struggles with alcohol addiction, are you a jerk if you crack a beer in front of them? What's the answer? Absolutely you are. If you have a friend that can't tame the tongue, should you jockey verbally back and forth with that person? No. If you don't know, you shouldn't. 
right? Because you're going to cause them to sin. It doesn't matter what the sin area is, right? Because there's two types of people. What is it? There's Jesus and everyone else. There's only two lines. There was one person who was perfect. Every human, every other human being who's ever lived isn't. And we all have things that are very tempting for us when they're dangled in front of our noses. And Paul says, if what you're doing is causing another believer to sin, you should not do it, dum-dum. That's it. He says, it's not that complicated, right? If what you're doing is causing someone that you love to sin, what are you thinking? Yes, you have the freedom to do that. But if you're going to destroy someone's life, is it good to do it? Of course not. And that's what they're wrestling with. The Corinthian church has a love problem, not just for God that we found before, but they have a love problem towards each other. And Paul calls at the end to give up some of our own preferences and desires for the sake of other people coming to know, love, and follow Jesus. And over these last two weeks, I gave two challenges and two questions to wrestle with. First, I challenged people a couple weeks ago to know what idols you're tempted to worship and share it with those closest to you. I'm sure everyone had great lunches that day, right, as they shared those idols that they love right, with those closest to them. And then I challenged you to love and get to know the people around you enough to know what those temptations are for them and be like a loving and good friend by staying away from those things when you're together, like having hope and being a Lions fan. I'm joking. Anyway, I'm, I'm, jo- I'm, jo- I'm joking. I, I, I'm that's not helpful. I'm, I'm sorry. One, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. Anyway. And then last, we said, we, we finished with this. I asked a question last week. Will you really, seriously, think about this. Will you put the gospel needs of the lost before your own personal preferences? Or will we put ourselves and our preferences before the gospel? And we find ourselves in chapter 10, verses 1 to 13. So if you join me, it will be up on the screen behind me. If you grab your, I'd love for you to grab your Bible and read along. We'll be starting in verse 1 and finishing in verse 13. Hear the word of the Lord. Here's what Paul says. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place. As examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it was written. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. But they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Let's pray. Jesus, we're grateful that in the midst of difficult seasons and situations, you choose to be with us. Lord, we're grateful for our brothers and sisters in Corinth who 2,000 years ago wrestled deeply with what it meant to follow you, Lord, and we live in the legacy of their struggle as they wrestled with what it looked like to follow you in the midst of a culture that feels far from you. Lord, we pray today that in this time and in this space that our minds and our hearts would be focused exclusively on you and your good news. Lord, we set aside our worries and our cares just for this moment. Lord, that we might hear from you and the goodness of your gospel might fill our hearts. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Paul begins our passage today by connecting our story and the story of the Jewish exodus. The exodus is the story of God coming down to earth to seek, to save, and to form a nation and a family from an enslaved group of lost and wandering, broken people. And in Egypt and on, in Sinai all those years ago, from these lost, wandering, and broken people, God made a covenant, a promise, that they would be blessed so that they could be a blessing to the nations and he would form them into a people named Israel. And through a series of covenants, God set them aside for a special purpose. He made them holy. And the people who were tasked with turning, believing, and following God instead of themselves or this world around them. And God called them his beloved and his chosen people. And they were chosen because they were perfect, right? Because they never made mistakes. They got it right on the first try every time or the second try at least. No. They were chosen not because of their perfection or their worthiness or because they were better than the other people around them. I'm going to read that one more time so none of us get deluded. They were not chosen because of their perfection, worthiness, or because they were better than the people around them, but instead as an act of grace, of unmerited favor. God chose broken and rebellious people like you and like me to make a covenant with. Does the Exodus story sound familiar at all? Kind of like the foreshadow of another time when God would come to earth. And he would seek and save lost and wandering people that they would be found, built into a community, given a purpose. A price would be paid for their ransom, and they'd be delivered and called and sent to bring that good news to the nation once again. But before we get too far, today we're going to nerd out for a minute. How many are super excited? Don't raise your hand. Don't don't raise your hand, because that makes me sad. Don't don't do that. So I need you to grab your bulletin real quick. If you got one, I hope you got one on the way in. You got a little itty-bitty page and a real big page. It's like half, half these, halfsies. So, So here's what we're going to do. As we go through this, we have a really important theological concept that we got to get our minds around, or or this is not going to make sense at all. So let's talk through this a bit. I want to define an important term that helps us understand what Paul's doing as he talks about this old covenant picture in the Exodus and compares it to our new covenant experience today. So here's what a covenant is. It'll be up on the screen. It's a God-initiated. Do we initiate it? No, a covenant is always God-initiated. It is binding, no do-overs. It's living, right? It's not like a will for after you die. It's a present reality. And it's a relationship with blessings and obligations. So a covenant is a God-initiated, binding, living relationship with blessings and obligations. So when we say God initiated, anytime we see a covenant in Scripture, that God comes and reveals himself and calls people into discipleship, into this relationship where they follow him, and God makes a commitment to humanity. And this bind in relationship reminds us that we belong to God and once entered with like with any covenant once it's entered the only way out it's blood in blood out for a covenant right the only way out is through the shedding of blood can alleviate the violated covenantal obligations And inside this covenant, there are rules if you're going to be a part of it. And there are living arrangements that confirm 
and order a person's life with God and other people in this world. Life with God is not simply about what comes after death, but about living with, for God and with God here and now. So often when we think of covenant and eternal relationship with God, we think of it after the moment, right? But, but eternity begins in people's hearts as they enter into relationship with Jesus. And fourth, that it's a unique relationship that God, in the midst of a covenant, takes people as his most precious possession and gives us himself as our most precious. And God's covenants always entail benefits and responsibilities, privileges and duties, and God's sovereign good and wise design. These things are meant to be inseparably, inseparably intermingled so that we delight in duty, and duty is a delight. Here's what that means. It means the good things that God calls us to, they're actually good when we do them. Right? And the bad things that God warns us from, that when we go to those places, it doesn't turn out well at all. And violated div divine covenants in Scripture always result in death. The death may entail either the death of the covenant breaker or the death of a substitute. And so as followers of Jesus today, this is why Jesus came to live the life we could never live and pay the price we could not pay to fix this broken relationship between humanity and God. All right, here's why I did this. I want us to understand that as we're reading the Old Testament, it's not some far-off distant God, right? It is the same God from beginning to end, whether we like it or not, Right? We do not fit God around our presuppositions about God, but we build our understanding about God by who God reveals himself to be in Scripture. Does that make sense? So as we go through this, I just want you to be open-handed. And so here's what Paul does. Here at the beginning of our passage, Paul is connecting our story to the story of the covenant people of Israel and the Exodus journey. And not just comparing these two journeys that we're both on, but reminding us that it's the same Father, it's the same Jesus, it's the same Holy Spirit who's working with them as God is with us today. Doing the same work of transforming, renewing, and forming us into God's covenant people. Here, Paul is using God's inspired, inerrant word from the Old Testament and teaches us about the teaches us about the same God of the New Testament so that we might be free and unbound by the destruction of sin that wrecks us and the people around us. All right, Bible fact for the day, and then we're getting to the passage and we're going to have fun and all those things. The word testament means covenant. Old Testament, old covenant. New Testament, right? New covenant, Right? And so same God, right? We call this covenantal theology from the very beginning of Genesis all the way through. God has been making these covenants from Noah to Abraham to on Sinai to making this, co this covenant in its fullness in the coming and the life and the death and the penal substitutionary death of Jesus on the cross. So, so as you go through, I need you to keep these things in mind. As he's using these examples from old covenants, no, we don't fully live under them, but it's the same God who made those agreements between humanity and God. Does that make sense? Even if it doesn't, I'm moving on. We got this. All right, so open your Bibles back up. We're going to be spending some time in verses 1 to 5 together as we work through what Paul's saying, as he's trying to help them tease out and figure out what it means to respond in a Christ-like way to the situation they find themselves in. Here's what Paul says. For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate of the same spiritual food and all drank of the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. For they were overthrown in the wilderness. All right. Is there anything wrong with being unaware or ignorant of something? Yes or no? No. What is a problem, though, 
is when you become aware of something and you don't change. Yes? Right? And so this is one of those moments is, is Paul's like, I don't think you get it. So in grace, Paul's going to unpack for them a greater understanding of what it means to follow Jesus in this moment. My hope today is that we unpack this, that we would be more aware of the path that God's inviting us to walk as individuals and as a community. All right, so for the first century Jewish hearers in Corinth, this text would be like lights and sirens going off because Paul is hitting some of the most wonderful moments in the history of Israel and some of the most deep and shameful and horrific moments of their history. So I want to just walk through these images that Paul's touching on so that as we work through this, you can understand what he's saying and what he's trying to convey. So here's, here's four observations about what Paul's communicating. He starts off by calling our father, and right, right, that's, that's gendered language. So that's, the, it, it, it's like, hey guys, right? So this is talking about men and women. Like this is, like, it, it's meaning that we're connected as New Testament believers, as New Covenant believers, to the Old Testament and the covenant people. That, that our story today as followers of Jesus is, is, I'm curious, is anyone here actually Jewish? All right, me, me too, right? So all of us are grafted on this beautiful tree by this family tree of faith of people who have walked for 3,000 years following God. And he says that, that those people, that our fathers, walked under a cloud. And when they say under a cloud, they're talking about the Shekinah glory that overshadowed Israel throughout their journey from Egypt to the promised land. And during the day, the cloud sheltered them from the brutal, brutal desert sun. And during the night, it burned as a pillar of fire. And it was a constant, ready reminder of God's glory and presence. And then he goes on to say that all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. On the way out of Egypt, Israel came to the Red Sea and saw God's incredible power in holding up the walls of the sea so they could walk over on dry ground. They saw God send the waters back to drown the Egyptian army in Exodus chapter 14. And this was not only an amazing demonstration of God's love and his power, but it was an amazing picture of baptism, of the passing through the water of all Israel as they identified with Moses. Even as today, as we pass through the water and are baptized, we identify with Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he says they ate the same spiritual food and drank the same drink. All of Israel during the Exodus journey was sustained by manna from heaven, this miraculous provision of food and drink, and this remarkable display of God's love and power for Israel. And if you didn't know, each Sunday as followers of Jesus, as we gather together, we take bread and we break it and remind ourselves of God, and we take the cup and we remind of, of God's provision of life and sacrifice. As this picture in the Exodus echoes the reality of the Lord's table in the present. That Paul says we can have this unity of experience and commonality with those we're reading about in the Old Testament because we're worshiping and in relationship with the same God. We share in this history and reality because it was Jesus who provided then and it's got Jesus who provides now. And yet, as they say, he, Paul finishes up in verse 5, and he says, Nevertheless, with most of them God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. By the way, how many of the original people made it to the promised land? How many people know? How many? Two. Two. Caleb and Joshua. Only two who made it through. Verse 6, let's keep going. Now, these things took place at ex as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. 
We must not indulge in sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed by serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. And you guys are feeling very encouraged. There's some great and important stuff coming. Stay with me. Listen, our lives, yours and mine, will be defined by one of two realities. We will be an example to follow, or we will be a cautionary tale to warn other people. Or a little bit of mix of both. As we were working through this, as I was thinking about the future, I wonder what people in 10 or 15 years will look back on us in our moment. And I wonder which one will be as a church. Will be an example to follow of faithfully following and serving God? Will it be a cautionary tale of people sidetracked by things that don't matter and preferences and competing wills? And, I, and I'd say, what will we choose to be as individuals? Because both these matter. And during this time, about 30 years after Jesus' death, when Paul's writing this, Israel serves as a cautionary tale for the effect of unrepentant sin in our relationship with God and our relationship with each other. It's so funny. We think about sin, and we think if no one knows about it, it doesn't affect them. Is that actually true? When you and I do wrong things, what do we think about? What do we think about? We just think about the wrong things we've done over and over again, and we try to, like, self-justify or do enough good things to, like, that we can balance out our karmic debt, which is, like, totally heretical and insane. But do we do it anyway? Anyone else, like, done something wrong? Be like, all right, God, I promise this the last time. I'm never doing this again. Has anyone ever made that bargain with God and lied other than me? Right? Like, but we do it because we think that that's how it's supposed to be. But I'm going to tell you the good news of the gospel is something different. Paul is warning us of the consequence of putting our own desires, our own will, and our own timing, which I think are just transcended like temptations for all of us. For us to put our will, our desires, and our timing ahead of God's desires, God's will, and God's timings for our life. And so I'm not unpacking these, these passages that Paul's referring to, but I'll give you the references if you want to go back and read them, and we could talk more next week. You can grab me, right? So here's what he, So Paul's talking about these obvious moments where they were making terrible choices and sinning. So it's Exodus 32, if you want to read about it. It's Numbers 21 and Numbers 25. I'm not unpacking all of them. That's like a whole sermon in itself. We're not going there today. But what Paul's doing is, is when you go read those, like, you'll be disgusted, right? Because they just said, forget you, God. I'm doing whatever feels right for me. I'm making a cow to worship, and then I'm going to do all the things you said not to do all in one day. And Paul's going to go on to share how what seems to be this irredeemable evil and sin, Paul is going to use this in this moment through the power of the gospel to transform this horrible moment in the history of Israel into one of the most beautiful things you'll ever experience. God's using something broken and destroyed and transforming it through a heavy cost of the cross into something beautiful and useful. God is not just limited to redeeming the sin of the Old Testament for good that we're going to find out, but we're going to see as we finish that God's going to redeem our own sin and our own brokenness through the incredible beauty and power of confession of sin and who God is. And God's going to use that to bring his good news to the world. So let's finish this up, verse 11, because we're going to land in this back section for a while. It's so good. All right, here's what he says. Paul says this, Now these things happened to them as a what? They happened as an example, but they were written down for our what? Instruction. So pay attention. If Scripture says we're going to teach you something really important, what should we probably do? 
Like, pay attention. Like, let's get our heads there. On whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed. So listen up, lest he fall. No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. Listen. I'm sorry your preschool teacher lied to you. You are not special in this part of your life. Listen, you are not special. I'm going to read that one more time. No temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. Nothing. You are not the first person to do any stupid thing. I promise and I guarantee you will not be the last. Right? So as we go into this, I need you to hold this in your mind. Right? This is a really big deal because Paul's about to teach us something that if we can actually do, we'll fundamentally transform every part about how we engage in our past, our present, and walk in our future. So pay attention. He says this. So no temptation has overcome you that is not common to man. God is faithful. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Don't worry, I'm going to flesh that out. But with temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Here's what Paul says. Paul says the redeemed sins of the past are an example to teach us, guide us, and give us a path to follow in the future. Can I, can, I'm just going to say this. Whether you believe me or not, I don't care. I'm going to tell you the reality on this just simple thing. The greatest thing that you have to offer this world is the pain and the suffering and the sin that you have walked in in this life. It's the pain, it's the suffering, and the places where you walked away from Jesus. If you are willing to be honest about those things, that is the only good news you will bring to this world. You do not bring any good news when you pretend that your stuff's always together, it doesn't stink, and you don't struggle. Jesus says, in this life, there will be suffering. But take heart. I'm with you. And I've overcome the world. So I want you, because we're, uh, we're about to do something, and I'm going to probably ask you to take a risk at some point. Don't worry, not out loud. But I'm going to ask you to take a risk to identify some things. I need you to know the things that you most regret, the things that have hurt you most, and the things you want no one to know, that that's God's greatest strength through you to bring his good news to the people around you. I, I need you to just believe me for like 10 minutes so you can mentally get there. I, I, I want to read to you how Eugene Peterson, one of my favorite theologians, as he reflects on this passage, here's what he wrote. These are all warning markers, danger, in our history books written down so that we don't repeat their mistakes. Our positions in the story are parallel. They at the beginning, we at the end, and we are just as capable of messing it up as they were. Don't be so naive and self-confident. You are not exempt. You could fall flat on your face as easy as anyone else. Forget about self-confidence. It's useless. Cultivate God confidence. No test or temptation that comes your way is beyond the course of what others have had to face. All you need to remember is that God will never let you down. He'll never let you be pushed past your limit. He'll always be there to help you come through it. I'm going to tell you what this does not say. Is this saying you'll never feel overwhelmed? Yes or no? Jesus on the cross said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Paul died in, the guy who wrote this, died in obscurity with one or two friends, rejected by most of the churches because it was too costly to be associated with them. That sounds terrible. Listen, people quote this and say like, it's never going to be too hard. You can make it through. You know what? On your own, can you make it through? Yes or no? No. You have no hope 
So people who just say this and say, just push harder, are lying and deluding God's word. That is not what it said. Does it say you as an individual can work hard enough, and if you're just positive enough in your thinking, you'll be okay? Not at all. It says God gives an escape. So, so there is a way to persevere when things get really hard, but it's not, I'm going to say it's not the way that most of us choose to walk it. And so here's Paul's wisdom on how to escape temptation when it overtakes us. Here's the two steps. You got to first confess who you are, and then we got to confess who God is. You're not God. You're not perfect. You're fallible. Right? You get grumpy. Some of us wake up on the wrong side of the bed for the first 45 minutes of the day. Can I get an amen for the other people who pretend they're asleep just so no one will talk with them? Yeah, it's me, 100%. My kid's like, oh, you're sleeping. I'm like, yeah. Anyway. The word confess, when we think confession, we have, a, we have a wrong thought. So confession is speaking the truth about something. Does that make sense? So, so, so when we talk about this, when God provides an escape, he does provide an escape, but it will hinge on us being realistic about who God is and who we are. And so I want to talk a bit first about who we are and how God gives us an escape and a way forward as we work through this. So here's who we are. Did you know that people are prone to giving into temptation? Did, was, was anyone not aware that people are prone to giving into temptation? Did you, anyone not know that? There you go. For, for none of you. All right. So because of that, we need God, we need God's word, and we need God's people around us to give us strength. So here are the three things that we need, and I'm going to say these are the three escapes that God's given us so that we're not overcome by sin, that God has gifted us himself in relationship. He's gifted his word, and he's gifted his people. And I'm going to say, if you try to do one of the three, it won't work. If you try to do two of the three, it still won't work. You'll need to have all three of these things if you actually want to live a life free of the long-term chains of sin and addiction in our lives. That it takes all three of these things working together while following Jesus if you and I want to be free from the things that would enslave us. So I want to talk to this first thing. How many people, and I'm going to ask for actual show of hands, how many people the idea of coming up here and praying into the microphone would make you want to like freak out and vomit and terrify you? It's okay, I'm, just, I'm curious. All right. Right? So, so, so listen up. And, and, and the people who didn't raise their hands are like terrified of what it would be for them to have to be quiet for a whole hour. Right? It would be very difficult for them. So listen this up. So people are prone to giving into temptation. So we need God and his strength and his presence. And, and we know as followers of Jesus, if we've chosen to follow Jesus, what has God given us as a, as a gift to us? What is God's gift to us to allow relationship with him? It is God the Holy Spirit, great, who's called the Advocate and the Comforter and the Helper. He got the same name that Eve got in the garden, right? Is the, is the name of God's Holy Spirit, the Helper that comes alongside of us to strengthen and encourage and build us up. So we have access to God as followers of Jesus because he said his spirit has chosen to dwell within us and it will convict us of sin and guide us into all truth. And pull us away from the things that will draw us away from God and nudge us towards. But is our internal perception of what God's doing enough for us? Anyone ever been really convinced that something's right on the inside, but it tended not to be when you actually tried it out? So we need this inner voice and we need God, the Holy Spirit. But that does not give us perfect discernment. And I'm going to just put, go on a quick aside. In general, Christian denominations over history have picked one of these three things. Like set their flag there and neglected the other. Right, as followers of Jesus here in our grouping as part of Converge, we want, we want to place our flag in all three of these. We want to believe that God the Holy Spirit's real and speaks and transforms. We want to believe that God's word is true and we want to hold fast to community. We don't want to pick a lane. We know that in order to go forward, we need all three. So the first thing is we need God and God the Holy Spirit with us. Right, the second thing we need is God's word. I'm just going to tell you, I can't tell you how many times 
I've like not read scripture and then like got to something a day too late for myself or someone else. Like I can't tell you how many times I've not had to anguish over a decision because scripture's just really clear on the matter. Can I just say one of the most horrific things we can do in this life is to give someone too many options, right? Like ask your kid to plan their meals for their birthday. Uh, right? They like, you know what I mean? They change it every 30 seconds. It's all stressful and all that. And so, so all that to say, one of the incredible gifts of God's word is some things, it's really nice to not have to figure it out. It's like, hey, should I punch my brother in the face when he's irritating? Hoyt, what's the answer? No, no, the answer is no. <laughs> All right, God's word. We're going to look at that. Like, let's hang out. After church, we have youth group. We're good. Don't worry about it. Right? But, but, but in all seriousness, there are some things in life where we don't have to figure out what the answer is. We can just read God's word and say it's wrong. What a, is it ever wrong to feed a hungry person? No. Is it ever wrong to give someone who's thirsty something to drink? We don't have to think about it. Is it wrong to shelter homeless people? Is God going to be like, man, I'm just so mad that homeless person has a house now. Like, what were you thinking? Right? Is that, is that in the book? We don't have to worry about that. Is it ever wrong to share about the good things that Jesus is doing in your life? No. Is it ever wrong to invite somebody to hear the gospel at church? No. If you think that's, I mean, well, maybe. It depends on the Sunday and what I'm talking about. But, but no, seriously, it's like, it's like God's word allows it to be really clear. 95% of our decisions, like we can just rest on the truth of God's word. Like, let's just be less clever than that. Third thing. And this is the one that I think in our moment and in our time feels really hard for a lot of people. Can you just really quickly look around the room? Just nod at me for a moment. They're all sinners. All, all of them. All the people you see are sinners. Did you know that they've sinned before? I, all, all of myself, include all of us. Right? Unless you think you're Jesus, and then you can't be here, right? Because you're insane or a liar or like a cult leader or something. Anyway, whatever you think you are, like that's insane and evil. You're not, right? Repent, believe, and follow. But for the rest of us, goodness gracious, we're terrified that's how let's just be honest. Are we terrified that someone might find out we sin? How hilarious is that? Like, what do you think people think about you? Right? Do you think people are like, wow, man, that's just sinless perfection when I see that person. Like, I'm sure they, right? Do you think anyone thinks that? But do we think that we need to pretend that that's the reality? Have you ever disliked someone more because they shared how much they were struggling with an issue? I, I've yet to meet someone that I hate because they were honest about something they're struggling with in their life. Anyone know someone that you just, man, like they told me it was wrong and I just, I hate them. Like, I just think they're awful, right? Or, heaven forbid, you confess and tell a friend that you're struggling with sin in an area. I'm sure they'd hate you forever, right? Right? That would really prove you're not friends with a person if you were honest about what you were struggling with in that part of your life, right? But we function there, and it's insane. Can I just tell you, I've yet to meet a person who had long-term freedom from a long-term sin issue without community, I'm sure it's possible, right? But you're never the exception, and neither am I. And if you are, what a gift of grace, right? It's not happening next time, right? Every transformation you and I want to make, it requires a community to walk alongside us as we work through it. So we have to remember who we are are people deeply in need of God and his word and his people to walk alongside with us. Second, we got to be clear who God is. And so I'm going to read what Paul says in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16, because I can't say it any better than this. Here's what he says. Here is a trustworthy saying. Let me, Paul wrote a dozen books of the New Testament. Anyone be okay hanging out with him? Sounds great. Yeah, check this out. Here's what he says, right? Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. He's like, just accept it. Christ Jesus has come into the world to save what? Sinners. Okay, good. Right? Of whom? Who's the worst? I am the worst. Who is that I? That's Paul, the guy who wrote, you know, a dozen books in the New Testament. He's like, I'm actually the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown what? Mercy. God showed mercy because of the state God found him in, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him. 
and receive eternal life. Were they all just marveled because Paul was just perfect and sinless and had it all together all the time? Were they just, did people just flock to following Jesus because Paul just like had it perfectly buttoned up? Have you introduced yourself recently as greatest of sinners? Maybe we should try. Like, maybe we should try. Like, what would that look like to think? Now, I'm not saying be weird. Like, don't go now to, like, bungalow and, like, quote weird verses to, like, your waiter so that they want to, like, end themselves, like, during the meal. Don't do that. Don't be weird. I'm not saying be weird, but I'm saying just don't lie. Just be honest. And, I'm, I'm, and I'll, listen, you oversharers, I, am I giving you permission to awkwardly overshare? No, right? Like, find a good friend. Don't do that with strangers. Like, that doesn't work. But what Paul's saying is his strength for proclaiming the gospel of Jesus is in his identity as the greatest of sinner who's received mercy. I'm going to say Paul's probably a marginally better person than me. And he's not. All at the same time. Because we have the same access to the same spirit and the same word and the same gift of community through all time. I love that Paul doesn't give you or me an ideal to go after, but a real plan of escape. A call to repent and believe and follow Jesus. That God calls us to turn away from ourselves and our own desires and look towards God and replace our desires and plans with him through communion with the Spirit of God, through submission to his word and in fellowship with his people. We need to believe what Jesus believes about us and about himself. That Jesus came to save sinners. Like I just, I, I get so heartbroken as I talk with people. Like, hey, I couldn't go to church. The building would fall. I, this is what I hear all the time. Building would fall down, right? Like, I'd ruin it. You have, or you don't know what I've done. You don't know the things that I've walked through in this life. There's no place for me there. What if we believe so wholeheartedly that Jesus came to save sinners that everyone in our community knew that if they saw themselves at this, that there was a place for them to hear the good news of the gospel and that God's plan to use our confession of sin and the confession of who God is to build each other up and to bring the good news to the world. And I love that following Jesus invites us to be conduits and part of the good news going out into the world. So as the worship team comes up and we, and we finish and we take communion together, like that manna and that rock from the Exodus journey, as you come up for communion, remember that Christ came to save sinners. And that it's at that table... And through the power and the ugliness of the cross, that you and I are welcomed in into relationship with Jesus. So, so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Something I did growing up is, is my parents asked us to uh, take a moment, and if we had sin that we needed to confess so that we could be free, to do that before taking communion. Um, so I'm going to encourage you that, that as you come forward for communion to take a moment and if there's something heavy on your heart to ask God for forgiveness and trust that he has come to save and to forgive and show mercy. And if there's not something heavy on that, as you walk forward, remember that Christ came to save people like you and like me. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Church, is this our table? No, this is Christ. So if you've decided and chosen to follow Jesus, come forward and receive the gifts of God for the people of God. Let's pray. Jesus, we're so grateful that you have chosen to be with us. Lord, that from eternity past to eternity future, you stay the same. Lord, and that by the gift of your word, by fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and by the community of faith, you've provided a way of escape. Lord, I pray that we would be courageous enough to follow you there. Lord, may our fear and our insecurity not win the day, but may our faith and our hope and our trust in you. Lord, we're grateful that you welcome us to this table. We rejoice and we thank you in this great Thanksgiving. Amen. As you're ready, come forward and receive communion.